So after the success of special relativity, Einstein wanted to form general relativity, one that did include gravity. So remember, the special theory of relativity is special because it does not include gravity. So the general theory of relativity was published in 1915. Now the problem that Einstein had going from special relativity to general relativity was gravity. That's why special is special. Now specifically the problem with gravity is that we treat gravity as a force. And if you're dealing with gravity as a force, then you have to worry about everything else as a force and it all becomes complicated really, really quickly. But Einstein remembered something that Galileo had discovered. Okay, so that same Galileo we talked about previously. Galileo showed that all objects accelerate due to gravity at the same rate. Okay, now that is if only gravity is acting on them. Okay, well, what this means is that Einstein was able to, instead of dealing with forces, replace it with accelerations. This idea that gravity and acceleration can be treated the same is what we refer to as the equivalence principle. So, we can treat gravity as acceleration. In fact, there's no way to tell the difference. As a thought experiment for this, imagine that we have two people in rooms without windows or doors or whatever. It's a thought experiment. We can do all sorts of crazy stuff. And so in one case, we who are outside conducting the experiment realize that the room is actually on the earth. Now the only thing that we've given the person inside the room is an apple to try and figure out whether they are accelerating or in, under the influence of gravity. So in this case, because we know that they're on the earth, they have gravity pulling down on them. So our intrepid physicist here inside takes the apple and let's go to see what happens. Now we see that the apple falls. Now, being on the Earth, we know that this is caused by the pull of gravity pulling the apple down. Now in another case, we have another physicist who is in a room, but in this case, the room is accelerating up in space. Okay, so the room is accelerating up at the same rate that gravity is accelerating objects down. So, this physicist takes the apple and, again, lets go. Now, once they let go, the apple no longer has any forces on, acting on it, so it stops accelerating. But the room around it continues to accelerate and will accelerate up at 9.8 meters per second squared, which is the acceleration caused by gravity. Now, because the apple is not accelerating, then it appears that the apple moves compared to the room. Now notice, from the perspective of the person in the room, it will appear that the apple falls down. Now we know that the apple is staying still and the room is moving up, but from the perspective of the person in the room, it looks like the apple falls down. And it's going to fall in the exact same manner that the apple did here on the Earth. There was no way to tell the difference. So just using an apple like this, you're not going to be able to tell whether it's caused by the influence of gravity or if it's because you're accelerating. This, again, is the equivalence principle. So using this idea, Einstein describes gravity as a curvature of space-time that allows the acceleration we see. Okay, so Gravity is actually caused by a curvature of space which accelerates the object. I realize that didn't make much sense, so let's go through a thought experiment. Okay, so imagine you've got a giant trampoline. Now, in the middle of this trampoline, place a bowling ball. Okay, so, far away from the bowling ball, the trampoline's still flat, but as you get close to the bowling ball, it naturally dips down. Now take a marble and try to roll the marble from one side of the trampoline to the other past that bowling ball in the middle. As that marble is rolling by, the marble's motion is going to change. It's not going to be able to continue in a straight line. Now depending on exactly how fast you throw it, it could be that the marble just bends a little bit. It could, if it's thrown exactly right, actually come and start circling around the bowling ball, or it might just curve and fall and hit the bowling ball. Okay, but in any, in any of these cases, the direction and the motion of the marble is changing. 
Now the reason why the direction and motion of the marble is changing is because the trampoline itself is curved and the marble has to follow, around, follow along the bending of that trampoline. This is how Einstein is now describing gravity. Instead of the trampoline, we have space-time, and instead of a, a bowling ball, we've got something like the Earth or the Sun. Okay, so if something is getting too close to the Earth, it bends because the Earth has curved space-time, just like the bowling ball bent or curved the trampoline, causing the marble to bend. Now, this is an okay analogy, it starts to get you thinking in the right direction. There's definitely some things wrong with it, but we're not going to get into those. If you're getting it this much, you're in a good place. Now, any good theory needs to make testable predictions. That's one of the hallmarks of science that we talked about pre uh, previously. Well, this does make testable predictions. One of these is that gravity should be able to bend light. Now let's go back to the ideas of Isaac Newton. Okay, so with Newton, looking at gravity, gravity is equal to the mass of the two objects divided by their distance, squared. Okay, well, the mass of light is zero. Light has no mass. So the force of gravity is going to be zero. There's no force of gravity on light. Well, if there's no force of gravity, then we're also going to have no acceleration. Remember, forces cause acceleration. What this means is, according to the ideas of Newton, all light should travel on perfectly straight lines. Okay, so that was Newton's ideas. Now let's go to the ideas of Einstein. Einstein says that mass curves space, and it's the acceleration caused by curved space that we interpret as gravity. So in this case, what happens is as light is traveling through, it has to travel through space, so if space is curved, then the light has to bend as it travels through that curved space, just like the marble we talked about previously. So, according to Einstein, gravity curves or bends light. According to Newton, it cannot. Well, this is a testable prediction. We should be able to go out and see which is the case. Well, in 1919, there was a total solar eclipse. Now, normally, it's a very bad idea to stare at the sun. However, during a total solar eclipse, when the photosphere of the sun is completely blocked from view, that's a great time to go and stare at the sun. In fact, if you ever get the chance, I encourage you to stare at the sun during totality. However, because the sun is blocked, that means that we can use the sun to see if light is actually being bent. So, in this 1919 total solar eclipse, what, uh, there were several groups who went out to see if light bent. Specifically, there were stars that were known to be directly behind the sun during the eclipse. Now, if Newton is right, then the light from that star would head in a straight line and hit the sun, and therefore not actually reach the Earth. We would not be able to see those stars. If Einstein is right, then the light of the star, some of that light, would go just to the side of the sun, and the sun's gravity would cause it to bend so that it does hit the earth. In which case, from our point of view on the earth, it would look like the star had shifted from behind the sun to next to the sun. Okay, so it would actually get shifted out and away from the sun. Okay, well, these uh, again, there were several expeditions that went and searched for this shift, and they found that the star had moved by the exact amount predicted by Einstein. It was exactly what was expected. In other words, we see that light does bend because of gravity. Now, something else that general relativity was able to do was to help explain the motion of Mercury. As we look at how Mercury orbits around the Sun, its orbit is not actually a closed path. It does not always go back to the exact same place every time it goes around. Instead, the point of aphelion, the farthest point, slowly drifts around the sun every time it orbits. Now, we can actually explain a lot of this. Okay, this is caused by the pull of gravity of the other planets. So, because Venus is right there tweaking it, and then Earth is tweaking it, and Jupiter's tweaking it, that causes some of this apparent motion. 
However, taking into account all of these effects, there was still a motion of 43 arc seconds per year that could not be explained. Okay, now this is using Newton's laws and Kepler's laws, okay, those older ideas. There was this extra 43 arc seconds that we couldn't explain. However, once we take into account that Mercury is closer to the Sun and therefore dealing with a greater curvature of space, then we see this extra 43 arc seconds. Because um, another piece of this is that Mercury's orbit is actually relatively elongated. It has an eccentricity of about 0.2. Okay, most other planets are closer to zero. Okay, so it's going from low curvature to high curvature to low curvature to high curvature, and that transitions actually leads to this extra 43 arc seconds per year. So using general relativity, we can now perfectly explain the motion of Mercury. Another one of these predictions has to do with space-time. Okay, so remember that as space changed, so did time. Okay, well, gravity is a curvature of space. We're bending space, which means time is going to be affected. Specifically, the greater the curvature of space, the slower time goes. Okay, the greater the gravity, the more dilated time becomes. Uh, what this would mean is that a clock in the bottom of a building will run slower than a clock at the top of a building. Now, if you're thinking of regular clocks, there's so much variation in those we're not going to be able to tell. Okay? Specifically, the difference in gravity from the bottom of the building to the top of the building just isn't that much. Normal clocks won't be able to help us. However, we have tested the idea using very accurate clocks, specifically using atomic clocks. Okay? These atomic clocks are precise to billionths of a second. Okay, so super, super precise. So what we did is we took these two accurate clocks, we made sure they were perfectly synchronized, then we kept one on the ground, and we put the other one in an airplane so it could fly way up high. Okay, after it flew around for a couple of hours, they landed, and then we compared the time, and the one that remained on the ground was slower by the exact amount predicted. So we really do have these fluctuations in time caused by gravity. Now we actually see a similar thing affecting light. You can think of the frequency of light as the light's own personal clock. What this means is that light, in under stronger gravity, will appear to have a, a lower frequency if you're standing in weaker gravity. And if it has a lower frequency, it's going to have a longer wa wavelength and appear redder. This reddening of light because of gravity is known as gravitational red shift. Now, at least personally, I don't think well in frequencies, I always think in wavelengths. So what, how I have kind of thought through this is that as, gra as the light is trying to escape, gravity is pulling it down. And so as it's getting pulled down, those wavelengths are getting stretched out and the longer the wavelength, the redder the light. Now, this is conceptually correct. I don't believe it's mathematically correct, but hopefully it helps you get the right idea. So if you're in a place of weak gravity, looking at a light escaping something of strong gravity, then you will see that it is redder than it would be normally. All right, so let's start putting this all together with astronomical objects. So starting with something like a normal boring main sequence star. Main sequence stars absolutely have high gravity, however their surface gravity isn't extreme, which means that the light pretty much is going to leave pretty, uh, pretty well in straight lines. Nothing weird going on in this case. So let's go to an object that does have extreme gravity. We'll go from main sequence star to a low mass neutron star. So a low-mass neutron star will have somewhere around one and a half times the mass of the sun, but it's going to be compressed down to the size of a city like Orem. Okay, well, in this case, we're absolutely going to be having to deal with intense gravity at the surface. And we see with this low-mass star that as light is escaping, it is bending because of that pull of gravity. 
Now, going from a low-mass neutron star to a high-mass neutron star, so this is going to be something with more like 2.5, 2.7 times the mass of the Sun, compressed down into something even smaller. It's still going to be city size, but it's going to be a small city instead of a larger city. In this case, as the light is trying to escape, the pull of gravity is so great that the light is absolutely and definitely bending. What this means is if you are looking at a neutron star, you will actually be able to see some of the back side. So normally, like if you're looking at the moon or the earth, you see the side facing towards you. On a neutron star, you see the side facing you and some of the back side because of this curvature of the light as it's trying to escape. Now, if we step up even more to a smaller object with even higher gravity, then as light is trying to escape, it gets curved so much that it actually falls back in. What this means is that the light did not actually escape, and if no light escapes, then the object is black. There is no light, it is black. So this is where we start to get the idea of a black hole. Now, another way to approach this. Okay, so going back to the idea of the trampoline. So we had the bowling ball and stuff curved down around it. Now take off that bowling ball and put something on like a cannonball, something denser. Then that curvature of space is going to be even deeper. Now take off the cannonball and put something even denser. It's going to get even deeper and then just keep stepping it up. And hopefully you can conclude that it, once you get it deep enough, then once something has fallen in, it's not going to be able to get back out. In other words, we created a hole. And this is going to work with light. Once the light has entered, it can't get back out, so this thing is going to be black. So we obviously name it a black hole. All right, here is our second lecture quiz question. What would happen to the Earth if the Sun were replaced by a one solar mass black hole? Okay, so by magic, instead of the Sun, we suddenly have a black hole of the exact same mass. A, Earth would immediately be pulled into the black hole. B, Earth would fly off into space. Or C, Earth's orbit would be unchanged. Go ahead and think about it and we'll discuss in just a bit. All right, what do you think? If the sun were replaced by a black hole of the same mass, then Earth's orbit would be unchanged. Now, if you're thinking your intuition based off of pop culture references to black holes, then shouldn't it be that the Earth would be immediately pulled into the black hole? Absolutely not. What's happening in this case is we have the exact same amount of mass and the Earth is still at the same distance, which means that gravity has not actually changed in any way. So the Earth's orbit would remain unchanged. Now notice, I didn't ask what would happen to life on Earth because without the Sun, bad times would happen. But as far as the motion of the Earth, it would remain the same. We often get this idea in pop culture that black holes are these giant cosmic vacuum cleaners, just sucking everything up. And although when you get really close to them, we do absolutely get weird effects, far away from a black hole, like the orbit of the Earth or the orbit of Mercury from the Sun, nothing is weird. In fact, you have to actually get surprisingly close to a black hole to start seeing these very bizarre effects. So again, the correct answer is C, the Earth's orbit would remain unchanged.